Thank you, everyone. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to be here today. I am at my office in Santa Cruz, California, just in case anyone's interested. And David and Anka, thanks for doing these. You do a great job for traders' education. And Norm, it's been a long time since we've talked. Good to see you again. I see you very strong and in good form. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have good news for you today. I have nothing to sell you. The only thing I want you to do is to give me your mind for one hour or less. Because I believe that if you can give me your mind and I can work with you, some things that I show you will make some sense to you. The most important thing I can tell you is this. After being in the commodity trading business, in all aspects, trading advisor, owned a brokerage firm, traveled extensively throughout the world. I'm a real trader, I really trade, I trade practically every day, I can tell you this. Don't believe anything anyone shows you, no matter how good it looks on a chart, until you see it and feel it and try it yourself. Looking at a chart is not really the entire picture. It is probably one third of the picture. The most important thing I can tell you is this. You need discipline. The problem is this. You don't know where discipline comes from. People say, hey, Joe, no wonder you can't make money trading. You need discipline. So you think, where am I going to find discipline? Am I going to find it in one of Jake's books? I've written 42 books. No, you're not going to find it in one of my books. You're going to find it at a psychiatrist's office laying on a couch talking about your proper potty training when you were a kid. No, you're not going to find it there either. Discipline comes from confidence. Confidence comes from having a trading strategy that works. That's the good news. The bad news is there are very few trading strategies that work because people don't know how to build effective strategies. I'm not going to talk to you about that today, but I'm going to talk to you about something different. I'm going to share an idea or two with you that I think will help you find the big moves. So first, the usual disclaimer. And you can read about me if you want to while I'm talking. The bottom line is this. When I started trading in 1967, it took me 15 years to realize that I needed something that was clear, consistent, based on rules, and not subject to interpretation. The dirtiest word in trading is interpretation. Six people looking at a chart, each of them coming away with a different conclusion about the same trading methodology. Give some Elliott Wave traders a chart, put them in a room separate from each other, same chart. After an hour, ask them what they think. You'll get my maybe six or seven different opinions. That does not work for me. I need complete objectivity. So what I teach in my work and what I trade in my work is completely clear and rule-based, no exceptions, no interpretation. But the bottom line is, as I said before, ideas. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Commitment of Traders Report because the Commitment of Traders Report will give you an idea of when the big moves are going to come and how big those moves are going to be. If you're not familiar with the Commitment of Traders Report, I will tell you this. It is the single most valuable piece of information that you can get about trading, and it's free of charge. You can get it at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission website every week. The data comes out on Friday, and it shows what happened the week before. So it's always a week or two late. It tells you what percentage of contracts are owned by three different groups of traders in the futures market. So for example, if you look at S&P, it will tell you how many contracts are owned long and short by commercials, long and short by speculators, long and short by small speculators, and so forth. So what does this mean? The most important thing is you need to know who these groups are. Commercials, the largest traders in the world. They account for over 90% of all commodity traffic from all commodity contracts. Large speculators, simply traders who take large positions, long and short, short term, simply for quick moves, usually trading a larger number of contracts. Small speculators, the one to three, two and three lot trader, who are usually wrong at important turning points. So the COT is divided into three categories. It tells you how many contracts commercials are long or short, large speculators long or short, small speculators long or short. So let me give you an example. And the most important thing I can tell you is this. I have made a ton of money being able to distinguish the difference between normal and abnormal. That is very meaningful to me because when I graduated from college, 
I was in clinical psychology and worked at a mental institution with psychotic patients. It was very important to be able to know the difference between normal and abnormal. I still do the same kind of work now, but I get paid a lot better. So the bottom line is, as I said before, what is normal? What is abnormal? Normal behavior in the market teaches me nothing. Abnormal behavior precedes changes in direction. I want indicators that spot abnormal situations like divergence. I want indicators that spot normal situations like seasonality and cycles, but I need to know how to use them. So let me give you an example. I'm gonna go to a chart. Here's a chart. It doesn't matter what you trade, I want you to get the concept. This is a weekly chart of corn futures. I will show you this, this uh, methodology on a number of different markets today. In the center of the chart, we've got some green stuff and some red stuff. The green stuff indicates the number of contracts held on the long side by commercials. The red stuff indicates how many contracts are held on the short side by commercials. This is very, very important, so please listen up. Example, right over here, commercials were buying contracts. Not every commercial was buying the contract, but the balance of power was on the buy side. So if there were 1 million contracts outstanding and 500,000 were long and 500,000 were short, the COT for commercials would be zero. This simply means there are more long positions and short positions. You will notice that previous to this move up in the market, commercials were long. They were buying before the move. Over here, they were buying before this big move up. Over here, they were buying a huge amount of corn before the current big move up. Similarly here, and similarly here, and similarly here, and here, and here, and here. So the relationship is very simple. Commercials buy markets before they go up. They accumulate positions on the way down. And what about this red stuff? You're gonna look at this red stuff and you're gonna say, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that all this way up commercials were short the market, they're losing their butt. The same thing over here, the market's going up and they're going short. Market's going up and they're going short. Why is that? It looks to me like they're wrong. The answer is this. This over here is normal behavior. It is normal for commercials to be short to the market because they're not really short. They're hedged to the market. Let me explain it to you. So please pay attention. This is a very crucial point. Farmer grows corn. He's got to do something with that corn. He's going to sell it to a commercial elevator operator. He's going to bring his corn to the elevator and say, hey, Joe, what do you give me for my corn? Joe will look at the Chicago Board of Trade. He'll say, well, let's see, corn's trading at 437. I will offer the farmer 430. He says, I'll give you 430 for your corn. The farmer's not happy. He says, how about 432? The commercial says, okay, I'll give you 432. He pays the farmer for the corn. The, corn, the farmer offloads the corn to the elevator and the commercial immediately turns around and sells the corn on the futures market at 437. Think about it. The commercial has just made five cents on corn. <coughs> Excuse me, doesn't sound like much, but on a large position, it's huge. If the commercial can do that 30, 40 times a day, we're talking real money. Now, the real issue is, is the commercial short? No, the definition of short means you sold something you don't own. The commercial didn't sell something they don't own. They sold something they do own. They're hedged. So what shows up here is a short position is very misleading unless you understand the report. Everything here below the line is normal. I am not interested in normal. I'm interested in abnormal. I'm interested in this. It is normal for commercials to be short or hedged to the market. It is not normal for them to be long. So let's back up a little bit. Why did commercials start buying corn on the way down? They started buying corn on the way down because they knew something. They knew this was going to happen. How did they know? Satellite, weather forecasts, supply, demand, consumption, foreign orders, orders from their customers, etc. So the bottom line, as I said before, is this. These periods of strong commercial buying activity will predict big moves 
to the upside. There is rarely an opportunity that they miss. They're usually right. Why? Because they can start buying on the way down and they can keep on buying all the way down until the market turns around. And then as the market goes up, they start to liquidate their positions. Very, very important. So looking at the chart this way without the clutter of the red is much easier. So how do we use this? I use this in a formula called setup, trigger, and follow through. A setup is a pattern. It tells you that something's going to happen. A trigger is a timing indicator. It gets you in. A follow through is a risk management procedure where you limit your loss and you maximize your profit. Within the context of what I do, everything here is a setup. So back here, when commercials started buying, I told my subscribers and clients, especially in the hedge, in the, in the commercial end of the business, get ready. When we get a buy trigger, we will buy corn. This is the result. So let me go to the next slide. How about this one? Interesting chart. Gold. For years and years and years, commercials had no position in gold on the long side. They were hedgers. As soon as that gold came out of the mine, they immediately sold it. Why? Because gold was trading in the futures at a higher price than it was in the cash market. So they could get gold out of the ground and immediately make money on it. So the normal behavior for commercials is to be hedge of the gold market. And of course, right now they're hedging a lot of gold, but I'm not showing it because it's normal. I'm not interested in normal. Back here in August of 2018 was the first time since the big bull markets of the 1970s and 80s that commercials bought gold. I want you to look at it. They had three spikes of buying gold right over here. What did that mean? It meant gold is set up to go long. Commercials are buying. <coughs> Excuse me. They're taking delivery of contracts. Go to your timing trigger and buy gold when you get a timing trigger. This webinar is not about timing triggers. This webinar is all about finding the big moves before they happen. You can use practically any timing trigger you want. Breakouts, trend lines, moving averages, divergence, etc., and make money if you have the right setup. At the same time that gold was being bought by commercials, which was a big tip off, a tell as they say, look what was happening in silver. For the first time in the entire history of silver futures, the entire history, commercials were buying silver. Very revealing and very significant. And what followed was a big up move. They didn't buy any more over here because they already had enough, but that's another story entirely. I just wanna show you what the history of this has been. And I also wanna show you what's gonna happen next. Let's go to the next slide. How about this one? Take a moment and digest this information. Before this move that we're in right now in copper, which is a historic move to the upside. This move in futures alone is worth about 15, about $30,000 in one contract. So what were commercials doing right over here before the up move? They were buying. Right over here, they were buying. Right over here, they were buying. Over here, buying, etc., etc., etc. So I make my case. During that period of time, if you were a futures trader and you were on the right side of the market, which was the long side, you made good money. But you didn't have to be a futures trader because you could buy an equivalent, a proxy, or an ETF in copper, example. The one I recommended was Southern Peru Copper, which at that time was yielding about 6% dividend and has moved 86% to the upside during this period of movement to the upside. Very simple. Now, what would it mean if commercials started buying again? Remember, not all the commercials are long, but the majority is long. The majority of contracts is held on the long side. So what would it mean? Since commercials usually buy on a scale down, if commercials started buying right now, that would be the most bullish thing that you could ever imagine. And copper prices will go and exceed, go to and exceed all time highs. So with that in mind, let me show you something and then I'm going to take questions from it. How about this? Take a look at this one right here. This is the mini Dow futures. So I ask you a question. What were commercials doing here? Here, 
before this big move up that's lasted several years. They were buyers. It was a tip off. It was a setup. It simply said, get ready to go long. This market will go higher. Then time passes. And here, super incredible is this. For most, for about three quarters of the year 20,000, and in including now, commercials were buying the Dow futures. But not only were they buying, but they were buying on a scale up. What does this mean? What, what it means to me is this. You can expect the long-term move in Dow to be higher. Commercials are not doing this for their health. They're doing this to make money. So let's ask another question. Who are these commercials that trade the mini size Dow? Banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, large speculators, sovereign wealth funds, etc. They're expressing their opinion by chasing prices higher in an up market. One of the most bullish things I've ever seen. So how do you play this? Trade from the long side. Go to weekly charts because this is an intermediate term move. Take weekly buy triggers and trade exclusively from the long side. Don't get fooled by the short side. Of course, there will be corrections, but let's look at something else. Similar situation, but this time, and by the way, that chart was a week old and here's the, the current chart right here. You can see it's continued all the way through the end of the year. How about this one? Let's look at this for a moment. This is the NASDAQ, the E-mini NASDAQ. Look at the relationship. And what I want you to see is the relationship between buying by commercials and up moves in the market. Look, this intermediate term up move was preceded by this. This intermediate term up move was preceded by this. This intermediate term up move was preceded by this. But here, a few months ago, something extremely unusual. A big spike in commercial buying. Twice as big as before. Followed up by another spike. So this move alone, per contract, was worth $40,000. Remember <clears> that <throat> within the scheme of things, Setup, trigger, follow through. This is just a setup. It tells me that the market will continue higher, but I need timing. It's an ideal way to get your timing and trend and take advantage of declines to support, which is a whole other concept. Today, I wanna to have extreme focus on basically two concepts, COT commercials and seasonality. Let's look at another chart. S&P, same situation. So again, I ask the question, what are commercials doing in S&P right now? They're still buying. That explains why the market is so resilient. That explains why yesterday, when the Dow was down four or 500 points pre-open, it took back everything that it lost plus more by the end of the day. Why? Because commercials are still buyers. It's a very bullish sign. Now look, don't confuse expectations based on this me this methodology with reality. The reality of the situation internationally completely sucks. We've got COVID, we've got potential for runaway inflation because the Fred's France, borrowing so much money. We've got problems internationally, politically all over the world. It's a horrible situation, but we're not trading fundamentals, we're trading facts, we're trading indicators, we're trading setup, trigger and follow through. So don't Pay attention to the news, it will absolutely screw you up. Let's look at another chart. The Russell. This over here was the biggest buying we have ever seen in Russell consistently for the longest period of time. And here again, before this big up move started, and again, I want you to notice where it's a leading indicator. So what does it mean? It means that over here and over here, large, commercial traders were buying the Russell index in the belief, <coughs> excuse me, or expectation that commercial, that, um, that smaller size companies would eventually move up. And indeed they have, they've been stronger than anything, but guess what? The commercial drying is, buying has dried up. Doesn't mean it's gonna go down, but it simply says that this party for the time being is over. What would it mean if commercials started buying again? It'd be the most bullish thing you can imagine. We'll talk about that if and when it happens.
Let's go to another joint. Sugar. So I want you to think for just a minute. I want you to look at the chart. Look at relationships. Don't let me, don't let me confuse you. Look at this. How did commercials do over here? They were buying. How did they do over here? How did they do over here? How about here? And what about this? So think about it. Commercials are doing something right now in sugar that they have never done before. They have never before bought as much sugar for as long a period of time as they have now. What the hell does that mean? Commercials are not buying sugar for their health. In fact, sugar is bad for your health. They're buying sugar because they expect either of three things. Whether to impact the fundamental supply, number one. Number two, the price is low and inflation will take it higher. Number three, an event such as a strike, such as a tragedy, natural catastrophe, that will cause the price to go higher. How do they know this? Well, commercials have more money than God. They've got weather forecasters, they've got their, their ear to the ground, and most important of all, they deal with producers, so they know what the producer is producing. They deal with end users, so they know what the end user is demanding. There's one more thing about sugar that you may not know, and that is this. Sugar is closely related to inflation because nobody needs sugar. When people are making a lot of money, even though it's an illusion during inflation, they spend more money on stuff they don't need. Sweets, candies, cakes, confections, and so forth. So what this is predicting, in my experience, is an inflationary move and an opportunity to do what? An opportunity to buy sugar for an intermediate term move in the futures or in a sugar equivalent. So how can you do this in the stock market? Well, let me show you. Let me find out. Okay, here is the sugar ETF. That copy, one moment. Here's the sugar ETF, SGG. And look what's already happened. If you know my moving average channel method, you know that right over here, sugar, trigger, and buy. Right over here, it came down to support. So the sugar bull market in the ETF has already started. And if you go to the sugar futures chart, it's already started here as well, but I have no timing indicators on this one. So let's look at another one. Coffee. Now that I've brainwashed you sufficiently into my methodology, I want you to look at the chart Think for just a minute. Don't think too long. Tell me what you see. Think about it. Okay, is that enough time to think? This ain't rocket science. Right over here, for the course of a year and a half or more, commercials were steadily buying, buying coffee all the way down. Then came this explosive bull market. $48,000 in profit for one contract. Then they started buying again over here buying for the course of about a year before this bull market. And over here, they've been buying coffee at one, two. For the course of about two and a half years, commercials have been buying coffee. They've taken delivery, they've put it all away, and guess what? You can expect an explosive bull market in coffee, and that has already triggered. Let me show you what I mean. Over here, a new coffee ETF, symbol JJOFF, and it has triggered a long position. If you don't like that, you can use this as a substitute. CZZ, Cozen, also given a trigger on the weekly charts. Cozen is a South American company where, of course, you know they grow, grow a lot of sugar, but the one thing they do in South America with their sugar is this. They use it for biofuel. So they're completely energy independent using sugar for their energy source. Let's go to another one. The current bull market in soybeans has been the biggest one that we've seen in a long time. Was that predictable? Absolutely. Here was the buying that preceded that move. So how do you put this into combination? As I said before, this is a setup. It tells you what's going to happen. Then you go to your, your timing triggers and you take a trigger that's consistent with the setup. I will show you that, I'll show you more of that in another webinar. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's another one. 
I am not a trader of orange juice futures. In fact, I hate the market. I love the drink OG, but I won't trade it. But that's going to change. Why? I want you to look at the chart. If you look at the entire OJ chart going back many years, you will see this. In my estimation, commercials have never been wrong in picking bull markets in OJ. In other words, right over here, before the biggest move up in many years, they're long. Over here, they're long. Over here, before this little up move and before this up move, they're long. And over here, they established their position last year. They're buying a little bit more now. So what to expect? So how am I gonna handle this situation? There is no ETF for OJ, but there is Coca-Cola that owns Minute Maid. Assuming that they're in the market and buying OJ, they buy it here, and as the market goes up, they sell it off to, their produce, to the public. So the bottom line is, big bull move waiting for an opportunity to happen. You need timing triggers. Let's look at another one. Lumber. <clears throat> Before the biggest bull market in lumber history, commercials started buying. They bought from September 2014 to September 2015, January, December, and so forth. They bought some more over here, and we get this huge move up. Before this biggest bull market in the history of lumber, they're buying again. It's a tip-off. Before this bull market, they're buying. Before this bull market, they're buying. On the, all the way up, they're buying some more. So who are these commercials in lumber? Really, really simple. Home Depot, Lowe's, construction companies, the big movers in these markets, the ones who need the lumber. So why were they buying here? They needed the stuff. It's really, really simple. So to understand what to do about this, very simple, because we've got two ETFs for lumber. W-O-O-D and C-U-T. Both of them made huge, gigantic moves that were substitutes or proxies for this bull market in lumber itself. I'm gonna show you a couple that are gonna really surprise you. Let's go to another one. Heating oil. Check it out. They're buying here at the bottom. They're buying here before the bottom. They're buying here before the bottom. They're buying here before these little moves up right over here. And recently, in January 20 or whatever, they were buyers before the big up move that's happening right now. Let's look at another one. Canadian dollar futures. So who are the commercials in Canadian dollar futures? Easy. Banks, Canadian companies that need to hedge their currency, speculators, hedge fund managers, and so forth. And what does it say about the dollar? Well, look at, <coughs> excuse me. They started buying the dollar right over here and continued buying all the way up and they're still buying small amounts right now. So this bull market against the US dollar is not over yet. It's just a question of timing. Let me show you another. Okay, I want you to put this in perspective. If you're watching the news, you're hearing all sorts of stuff about the US dollar. The US dollar sucks. The economy is going to hell in a handbasket. The economy is being inflated by the treasury. It's being mismanaged, so check it out. Looking at the what is underlying the surface, the commitment of traders report, you have got right now the largest, longest, most consistent buying of US dollar index futures in history. So what does it lead you to believe? It leads me to believe that commercials who are usually right, and I'll give it over 90% of the time they're right, are expecting the dollar to turn around. Well, what would make the dollar turn around? The dollar is closely tied to US interest rates. If the Federal Reserve or the new administration says, we can't have this easy, easy money policy uh, continue, we've got to start, we've got to tighten up the interest rates, that will make the dollar move higher because the US dollar index relationship with interest rates is virtually one on one. As interest rates go up in the United States, the dollar goes up. So here's the next big move in the dollar. How big will the move be? The, big, the move will be as big as the magnitude. In other words, the size of their buying is very significant compared to what it was before. So I'll give you a little bit of advice. Get ready for a major rally in the US dollar index futures. It's gonna start pretty soon. And here's the good news. 
there's the ETF for the dollar. It's UUP. UUP is the ETF for the dollar going up. UDN is the ETF for the dollar going down. So how to handle it? Go to a weekly chart of UUP. Take the next timing buy trigger. It may need to be established once or twice. You may have to get in once or twice and take a loss the first or second time. But this is going to be very big when it happens. Mark my words. Anyone here who's familiar with my forecast in the past will know that I've been right about most things most of the time. So let's go to the next slide. There's another approach to markets, and that is the cyclical approach. We can look at cyclical behavior in markets, and we can run a computer program that takes all the cycles into account and does a projection. I'm on the board of directors of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, cycles.org. We have a program there called the Cycles Analyzer Tool. We can take any market, study its history, extract all the meaningful cycles in that market, determine if they're statistically significant, and make one chart that shows what the market's going to do. This pink line is the projection of the various cycles on Bitcoin. The black line is what Bitcoin actually did. So this was our projection. This was the result. Here's our most current projection. We predicted this bull market. What's going to happen now? Again, we were at a top based on the cyclical work. So what's needed right now? And remember the context of what I do, the structure. Set up, trigger, follow through. This is a setup. What does it mean? You can expect the Bitcoin to start going down, and it will likely go down very sharply. We shall see what happens. But remember, in the absence of a trigger, all bets are off. We need a trigger. Let's go to the next slide. If I were to make a chart of one stock or the stock market in general, in terms of the averages, showing all of the years is in this case from 1982 to 2019, or in the stock market where we've got 100 years of history, and show what the market or the stock typically does during the year, it would look like this. So for this particular seasonal chart, I've taken deer, I've looked at every single year by computer in deer, and I've made an adjustment. For every year, the highest price was made into 100, the lowest price was made into zero, so that no one year could have an impact on the trend. This is a purely seasonal trend. It does not show magnitude. It simply shows direction. And what it says is this. This period of time from September to the end of the year has been the most bullish time of the year for this particular stock. It doesn't matter to me why. There's a reason for it, but the reason is not important. In addition to that, what I can do is this. I can ask the question, what percentage of the time did this stock move up or down during each week of the year. Example, these two weeks, November, third and fourth week, up 62% of the time, up 78% of the time, and they're, they're signified by arrows up or down. So I know this move down, this move in May will be a down week. These will be neutral weeks, not predictable. And over here is the most bullish time of the year. I can go to the computer and I can ask the question, computer, during this period of time, what would have been the optimum entry and exit to take advantage of this very strong seasonal tendency? Computer crunches some numbers and gives me this. It says, buying Deer and Company, end of day, December 12th, getting out end of day, January 6th, was right 92% of the time with a 15.6 to 1 profit to loss ratio, average profit, average loss, maximum number of wins, etc., over the course of many years. So what have we got? A very valuable piece of information that tells you everything you need to know with one exception. When to get in, when to get out, the time of day, because these are executed on the close of trading, the average profit, the average loss, including the stop loss, Incredible information. The only thing it doesn't tell me is this. Will it work this year? So what happened? We had this information last year. This was the track record right over here, year by year. 
very impressive track record. And even though I've been talking about this train and showing it for about 40, about 35 years now, it keeps on working. And here, after all of these years, it still turns in its best profit ever back here. I can look at the trades individually, year by year, the entry date, the exit date, the price, and so forth. And I can run the, profit, the, um, the statistics. So let me show you something. Here is the trade this year, the entry date, and where it is as of a couple of days ago. So let's talk about psychology. When it comes time to make this trade, you're looking at the chart and you're saying, there's no way it's gonna work this year, it's a downtrend, and it picks the bottom, the exact bottom of the move. If it was in an uptrend, you'd find a different excuse. So this has nothing to do with with economics, this has everything to do with seasonality and repetition. You know everything you need to know. Your risk, your profit target, your stop loss, everything you need to know. So let me show you something else. Here we go. Within this trade, there are two others. There's a shorter term and a longer term. If you took the trade at the beginning, September 27th, this is what it would look like this year. This was the entry date, and this is where it went. Again, very impressive record, but based on what? Based on the repetition, based on history, based on this chart right over here, which gave us the leading indication that something was going on. So again, it's a process of determining patterns, when to get in, when to get out, and having all the important rules which are necessary including a trigger. Let's go to another chart. Here we go. One moment, please. Okay, look. Every year I show these trades. Every year people have an excuse. This is especially true at webinars and seminars that are free. People believe that if something is given to them for free, it's gotta be worthless. I have taken the same product, the same book, the same indicators, offered them for free, had no people interested in it, offered them for two or $300 and suddenly people want to see them. The bottom line is, if it's free, it doesn't matter if it's valuable in terms of what it has done. I wanna show you something that's coming up and it begins today. And that is this seasonal trade. Buying Macy's, December 22nd, end of day, getting out December 29th, end of day with a 9% risk. These are all the statistics, 85% accuracy. So right now, Macy's is trading down 35 cents at 10, 10 a share. Let's see how it happens. Let's see what, what happens, okay? We'll know in the next couple of days. In order to take this trade, you need to risk a 9% stop close only. What does that mean? Well, right now with Macy's trading at 10, 10, a 9% stop would be 90 cents close only. In other words, it needs to go against you by 90 cents closing basis from the end of the day today. We will see what happens. I'm already in this trade, so full disclosure. I'm not concerned about what it can make. What I'm concerned about is, am I okay with the potential loss? That's the only decision I have to make. We'll see what happens. By the way, my track record does not rest on any one trade or any group of trades. It rests on 30, it rests on 37 years of trading. In fact, more than that. This was the trade last year. Entry date, exit date, picks up 32%, 3.5% in a matter of days, and then continues thereafter considerably higher. Let's look at something else. There's another trade coming up today, S&P. Long December S&P. I'm sorry, long March S&P, December 22nd, end of day to January the 7th, with a 4% stop. Very important. The average profit for this trade is 23 S&P points. If you know the S&P futures markets, you know that 23 S&P points can be achieved in a matter of minutes. In fact, it happens almost every day. So if we put the trade on at the end of the day today and we hit the profit target, we get out of part of our position immediately and place the trailing stop on the rest of the position at break even. 
which is our profit maximizing strategy. Because I have access to this at SeasonalTrader.com, I was able to make all of my trades, to, find, to get a listing of all of my trades through the end of the year. And this is what they are right over here. So we have a couple of trades that are coming up. We have one trade that's in process right now. We've had two trades in the last couple of, years, last couple of days, so we'll see what happens. So this is my list that I made a month ago. So before I take questions, if you're interested in what I do, jakebernstein.com, seasonaltrader.com, jakestradingstrategies.com, and the Cycles Foundation, cycles.org. Before we take questions, I want to cover a couple of more pieces of information. Just bear with me for a moment. Let's talk about this Macy's trade because I want to give you the full picture. So the entry is on the close of trading today at the market. The stop is 9% close only, which means it must close against you 9% from today's closing price. If it hits a 3% move after we get in, which would be roughly speaking, 3% of 10, roughly speaking about 30 cents, we get rid of one third of our position, we're out of danger, we ride the rest of the trailing stop. As you can see, if you do these trades, most of these will turn in profitable positions very quickly after reaching their, by reaching their first profit target. So remember, you're trading for the first target and that's, that's the extent of it. Let me show you one more thing and then I'll take questions. Just bear with me for a second. I'm gonna to go to a different location, right over here. Okay. And I'm gonna log in. If I can get there. One moment, please. Correct. Here we go. Let's say that I'm looking for gold trades in December. I go to gold, I click the month of December. I ask a question. The answers you get will be a function of the questions you ask. So what am I doing here? I'm searching a huge historical database and asking the computer to extract seasonal patterns for me that have high probability. I'm gonna ask the computer, has there been anything in gold that's been right 80% of the time in the entire history of gold futures? I do a search. Computer says, nope, there's been nothing that meets your criteria. I'm undaunted, I go back and I say, okay, fine. I'm happy being right 75% of the time. Is there anything that's been right 75% of the time? That's the question. Computer comes back to me and says, says what? Oh, I need to, get, I need to click the goal again, one moment, please. Here we go. Computer comes back to me and says, Yes, there's been a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, computer says, buying gold, February, December 15th, end of day, getting out December 25th has been right 75% of the time. The average profit has been 10 points. If you take some time, you'll see that the day after we got in, it rallied not just 10 points, but 40 points and reached its first target. But there's a problem with this trade, so we analyze it further. Let me show you the problem. I have access here to the entire history of the trade. Let me show it to you. Every single year for 45 years. Who gives you that kind of information? Where do you get that kind of information? And here's the problem. Look. In its history, it's had two very bad losing years. It is highly unlikely with these seasonals that they're going to lose three years in a row or more, three, more than three years in a row. So we know that the worst is over. Once we know this, even though we know that we're dealing with something that's very erratic, we can go in and take a position with limited risk because we have the opportunity to examine all the different possibilities, by which I mean, let me show you. Let's go back to this guy right over here. I can repeat the search. And we're say, just seeing, uh, Jake, we're just seeing the Macy's slide. We're not seeing anything on gold right now. Oh, really? oh yeah, 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 yeah. I understand why. Thanks a lot. Let me, let me fix that. Sorry about that, guys and girls. I can fix that right now. Don't go away. I'm going to stop share. Hold on, please. And I'm going to start share again. 
pick a different screen. Sorry about that, guys and girls. Here we go. Do you see it now? Still seeing Macy's. Okay. We'll go back and do it again. Just bear with me. Hold on, please. I might be a good trader, but I'm not a good computer guy. Here we go. What about now? You're good now. Cool. Perfect. So we did a search for gold. And let me repeat the search to show you the process. Return to search. Said to the computer, for gold futures, for the month of December, find me all trades or any trades that have been right 75% of the time. I do a search. Computer finds this for me. December 15th through December 25th. I can look at the entire history. I can look at all the metrics for this trade. A vast amount of history. In other words, 45 years of history. Right over here. Average profit, average loss. But here's the part that I didn't like about this trade, which caused me to be very careful. And that is that in its history, it had two very bad losing years. Of course, after the two years, it went on to do stellar performance. So I'm willing to take this trade, but with less risk. So if I find that 5% stop is too much, I can go back and repeat the search and ask the question of the computer. Is it possible to do this trade with less risk? What happens to the results? I return to the search like so. And I say, repeat the process, but I only want to risk 2% as an example. Like so, computer says, Jake, if you're not willing to risk more than 2%, there's no trade for you. I go back and I say, okay, I'm willing to risk 5%. Is there a trade for me? So as you can see, we're doing what Einstein said. Research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. Is there a trade at 5%? And the answer is yes, there is a trade at 5% and it's right over here. There's a trade at 3%. The numbers might be a little bit different in performance. So during this process, I'm able to achieve a very high rate of accuracy in practically any market. So let me go back and show you this on stocks. I'm going to go back to seasonal trades, U.S. stock trades, like so. I've got a whole bunch of them. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to pick Apple and see if there's anything in Apple. Here's Apple right over here. I'm going to search the month of December, like so, and ask the question, is there anything in Apple in December that's been right greater than or equal to 75% of the time? In other words, I'm looking for a pattern. And the answer is, ta -da, yes, but it would require 100% risk, which would mean no stop. That could be doable in an option, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to put a limit on it and say, I don't want to risk more than 10%. I go back to my search. And so, the reason I do this is because it's completely objective. The computer doesn't lie. Therefore, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. I'm not dealing with earnings reports. I'm not dealing with interpretation. I'm dealing with the actual facts. So what does it say? Let's look. Here's the trade. In fact, it's got four pages of trades. How do I know which one to do? The computer puts the best one in the top position for me right over here. December 24th to January the 7th. And what does the history look like? Right over here, 36 years of history. And here's the graph of the performance year by year. And there it is. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I do is completely objective and very clear. All I need to do is make sure, one moment please. All I need to do is make sure that I'm following the rules. So what I'd like to do is take questions. If anyone has questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Norma, David, you are Anka, you want to relay any questions to me? If there are any. Hey, Jake, uh, I'm not seeing anyone any yet, but uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, well, then let me so, uh, what ticker symbol for the dollar index? I think that was UUP, right? UUP. 
Uh, someone asked, how can I get the seasonal trader software? It's online at seasonaltrader.com. There's a free trial. We need to uh, lose that. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes, soybean oil and soybeans are buys on breaks to support. Correct. Okay, I'm going to do one more thing then. So let me back up, go back to the okay. screen share and show you something really amazing. I'm going to go back to, hold on a moment, please. Let me bog back in just a moment, please. Just hang in there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go back to seasonaltrader.com and show you guys something truly amazing as soon as I get there. And let me share screens. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, just hang in there. I'll get there eventually. Okay, no problem. David, I'm having trouble sharing the screen. Oh, are you seeing the green share screen button? No, it's disappeared. Oh, um. Hmm. Are you back on the Zoom window? Somehow I have the share screen button. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, every. Uh, Everyone's got one, except for. <laughs> um, you might have to switch back to the, are, are you on, are you seeing the zoom window with the chat and? Yeah, I am. Okay. Wait a second. Here we go. Oh, there might be a more button. It might've disappeared into there. Hang in there a second. Okay. Now it's loading. Okay. We're seeing M again. Okay, good. Let me do this. Okay, now do you see it? Yeah, high, high odd seasonal trades page, okay. yeah. Check this out, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna go to the stocks trades, like so. I'm gonna go to the Dow Jones, all the way back to 1900. Oh, sorry, 1920. I'm going to ask the question, has there been anything in the Dow since 1920, we're talking about 100 years, that's been right 80% of the time or more? So here's what the computer tells me. Buying stocks October 26th, holding till January the 10th with 15% stock has been right 82% of the time in the last 100 years. Truly a phenomenal statistic. Here's the history right over here. Let me bring it up for you. Check this out. There's the track record right over there. So very impressive. It confirms the fact that seasonality exists. It's well and alive. The bottom line is this. We know this before it happens. All we have to do is use it. So the question is, did it happen this year? Go ahead and take a look for yourself and see what happened. So David Anka, I'm done for my, uh, I'm done with my work for today. If I have questions, I'm done. All right, 
right, great. Thank you, Jake.